I want to read to you this morning from Psalm 36. I'm going to read the whole psalm. There's 12 verses. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in their hearts. There is no fear of God before their eyes. For they flatter themselves in their own eyes and that their iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The words of their mouths are mischief and deceit and they've ceased to act wisely and do good. They plot mischief while on their beds and they are set on a way that is not good and they do not reject evil. But your steadfast love, O Lord, it extends to the heavens and your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains and your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people can take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life and your light we see light. So continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. Do not let the foot of the arrogant tread on me or the hand of the wicked drive me away. This is a sort of a punchy, powerful punchy psalm. I want to share with you something that I read recently. After a man had finished mowing his lawn <laughs> and attending to the yard... He stood back with great contentment <laughs> and looked with pride on his work and saw how great it was. And as he looked over to his neighbour's fence, sure enough, he saw that the grass was greener. So he thought, what the heck is this? Goes over to his neighbour's house and stands there and looks back over his yard and goes, hey, look, the grass is greener. <laughs> so he wanted to know why that was. He wrote to a columnist in the New York Times and he asked that question. The response was short and sweet. He said, that's because you can't see the dirt. You see, when we are standing on our own lawn and we look down, we can see the grass, but we also see the dirt that is there as well. But if we're looking over there, over to the neighbour, you don't see the dirt that's there. All you see is the grass. So I wonder... What have you been looking at recently? What have the eyes of your heart been focusing on recently? Is it the dirt or the grass? Well, today we're going to allow Psalm 36 to speak into our life, to bring perspective and to bring hope to our vision. As we know, the Psalms are very rich liturgies. They enable us to connect with God. They include songs of adoration and praise, and we've sung songs of adoration and praise today. The Psalms include confessions of sin, declarations of being innocent, complaints about suffering. They include pleas for deliverance, um, the, assur the assurance of being heard. They include prayers before battle and thanksgiving after battle. And all of these psalms are Israel's unique, they express Israel's unique relationship with God. There's no other people who have a relationship with God like Israel. There's no other nation, no other country, no other community who could connect with God like Israel. And the psalms are a record of their relationship with God. And so today, the psalms are also uh, continue to serve as liturgies that enable us to express authentic prayer to God. They enable us to express praise or thanksgiving or lament or confession of sin or just disillusionment in life. You can put the first slide up. That Psalm 36 is primarily a wisdom psalm. It's got elements of lament and it's got elements of praise, but primarily it's just about wisdom. And a wisdom psalm, as the name suggests, short, sharp uh, statements that are ways of knowing and living and familiar with, if you're familiar with the Proverbs, you would recognise that the Proverbs themselves are short, sharp statements. They're not law, they're not poetry, they're just good advice for a happy life. You know, if you were asked to give a, one piece of advice to somebody who's, you know, 10 years younger than you, you'd probably give them just a, a statement or two of what a good uh, advice for living by. Well, that's what wisdom psalms are. They're just statements with good advice to help us live. 
This psalm contains a revelation that David received from God concerning wicked people of the day. David noticed people who had rebelled from the Lord and who chose to follow after false gods and those who chose to follow after their own hearts. David looked at these people and, and sometimes we can look at these people and think, oh gee, they're, they're living, their life is better than ours. You know, like They've got this good life. They're, they're living ungodly lives, but it seems that their life is more victorious than mine. But unlike the wicked, David rejoiced in the faithful love and righteousness of God. He chose to focus on God. One writer titled the description of this psalm, Humanity at their worst and God at, their, at his best. Now David was menaced by humanity at their worst, but he was inspired by God at his best. So David's opening statement describes the well-being of his heart. And he says, A divine oracle about transgression has been heard in my heart with reference to the wicked. There's no one who fears God. None fear God before their eyes. You see, the Lord had given David this special revelation concerning how the wicked look at their own life and how they live. If you were here a few months back, Rachel and Verna did a series on the Psalms of Ascent. And you might remember that beautiful image of the people walking up to the temple of Jerusalem. In that sermon series, Rachel uh, informed us that you can't understand the phrase, the fear of God, by breaking down each word and trying to understand each word, like fear of God. Same way you can't understand a butterfly by breaking down the word butter and fly. And so if we were to understand the fear of God, we need to sort of take a step back and look at it, not by understanding the word fear, but by looking at what that really means in the heart. It is to say that the wicked do not fear God. It means that they feel no uneasiness or no conviction that they've done wrong by God or others. You know that little sense of conviction that we might have? Oh, I think I might have offended someone or oh, perhaps I shouldn't have said that. That conviction that we have, the people who don't fear God don't listen to that voice of conviction. It's the basic characteristic of sin. It is the heart of sin. That's how Adam and Eve were able to disobey God and how humanity have walked in rebellion ever since. It is often a subtle turning aside from God. You know, that bit like a boat that has lost its mooring. The rope has come, un, um, has come loose from the pole and it just, as the tide comes in and out and as the current comes, the boat just gradually drifts away from its mooring. Or an illustration I've used before of lawn bowls. When you bowl the ball down, it starts off straight and correct and then the bias kicks in and it just sort of starts to turn a little bit that way. This is what it means to, to not listen to that voice of conviction, to not fear God. It's just this gradual sense of ignoring that and starting to turn away and drift away. So it is with human sin and rebellion. The more that we ignore that feeling of conviction, the easier it is to follow the path of sin. It won't matter, you know, we, we, we say to ourselves, oh, it won't matter if I do this. It doesn't matter if I watch this. It doesn't matter if, you know, I eat this or whatever. It's that sense of, I'll get away with it. God will still love me. It doesn't really matter. No one will get harmed if I do this. The human heart has a bent towards a lack of conviction. We have a bent towards drifting away from God. It is only through the presence of the Holy Spirit that we become aware of this inclination and this disregard and, and we are compelled then to return our heart to God. So the following six verses in Psalm 36 describe the six ways that sin and rebellion was manifest in David's world and I suggest still exists in our world today. Firstly, People flatter themselves in their own eyes that their iniquity can't be found out and hated. Or in other words, they think they've gotten away with it. No, therefore they keep doing it. 
And one of the bigger fears of um, when the pandemic hit with people working from home was the sense that employees could, you know, my boss won't know if I only work six hours today instead of eight. You know, it's that sense of, oh, I could do this and I got away with it. Nobody's noticed. Nobody's seen this. And so they keep doing it. In, when this happens, it often appears that evil is being rewarded. Like people who are doing the wrong thing are actually getting away with it and being rewarded for it. And so looking at it in that perspective, we can think that perhaps God's not present. God's not in control. Maybe God's absent altogether. Secondly, the words of their mouth are mischief and deceit. Or in other words, they lie and manipulate the truth <clears throat> in order to achieve outcomes that they desire with very little guard, regard for who is hurt in the process. See, deception can be present in the context of advertising. It can be just that little subtle, if you want to look like this, you have to buy this and wear this and eat this and use this product. Or if you want to be a good parent, you have to buy this for your child. It's that subtle deception that twists words to make uh, to, to serve only one's purpose and not to have any regard for the in impact that that might have on other people. Or deception can be present in the context of social media, using filters to show, you know, a healthy image or something that's flattering and not really revealing the truth. Deception can be present in the context of relationships. When we withhold information, we only give certain elements of information that present the picture that we want people to see and hear and know and don't and hold back things that we don't want them to know. And so this subtle deception is all about what is best for me without regard for others. Thirdly, they've ceased to act wisely and do good. So following on from the previous one, where using words only to serve their own wants and needs, this statement suggests that the un ungodly people use actions to accomplish their own wants and needs, and it rarely benefits others. This can be um, very overt actions, you know, like war or terror or immorality, where it's all about what I want and need, or it can be a lot more subtle, perhaps working extra long hours, getting ahead at work, being, receiving accolades from peers and colleagues, but neglecting family, neglecting the, uh, a relationship with God, neglecting health and well-being. So choosing to cease acting wisely and cease doing good can be both overt or subtle, but it's using actions to accomplish one's own wants and own needs with little regard to how it benefits others. Sometimes it appears as short-term wisdom, but it is long-term pain. Fourthly, they plot mischief while on their beds. Now, mischief is more than just planning a prank on your friend, okay? Putting glad wrap on the toilet seat. It's a little bit more than that. This is about planning malicious and cruel behaviour that will harm another person. It's usually the result of bitterness or revenge. It's that, I'll get you back. Possibly the response of fear or grief or insecurity. Manifesting anywhere from bullying in the schoolyard or bullying in the home or bullying on social media to something far more extreme like murder or war or genocide. So these statements are getting progressively worse. You know, just that little sense of, ha ha, I did something wrong and I got away with it, it's cool, I can keep doing this, to using words of deceit or withholding the truth, to um, doing actions that are unwise and not good, to then actually plotting harm. So you can see there's a progression here of them getting worse. The following statement is a summary of these activities. They're set on a way that is not good. 
the way of life that is self-serving, self-focused, self-driven and selfish without any regard for the well-being of others. And people usually attract to people who are like-minded. So they'll hang out with people who are like them. And those who are like them will go, yeah, good on you, mate. That was great. Yeah, you do that. Yeah, yeah. And eventually, all of these actions lead to a path of destruction. They do not reject evil. So without reverence for God, the wicked boldly pursue evil continually. They silence that conscience and they go on speaking deceptively and acting vainly without any inner restraint. All of this is a form of idolatry. This is worshipping our own heart and our own desires, our own wants and denying God's. We've heard it said before, you know, just follow your heart. Just follow your heart. But the prophet Jeremiah declares God's thoughts towards this. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and I search the heart to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. So as you look upon this list... I wonder where you notice these behaviours in the world. Do you see this happening around you in your life? Do you see people who are living a life that reflects these behaviours? Do you see it in your workplace, in your university, your friendship circles? Hopefully not in the church. <laughs> but do you see it even in your own life? What is it like for you to notice this list of behaviours? And do you resonate with David's opening statement? And for me, I'll reframe his opening statement. Ah, oh, my heart is breaking because I see the world. Nobody's fearing God anymore. Nobody's listening to that voice of conscience anymore. How does your heart feel? when you look at the rebellion around you. Because my heart feels heavy. It feels broken. I feel sad. I feel overwhelmed. Sometimes I feel angry. But David presents his response. His response to the rebellion around him. He delighted in meditating on God's attributes rather than disregarding them. Instead of pushing God out of his worldview, David placed God in the centre. Instead of looking at the dirt, he lifted up and he looked beyond that. Rather than being overwhelmed by the sin and rebellion and wickedness around him, David meditated on the character and nature of God. He lifted up his eyes and he took a fresh perspective. He said these words, your steadfast love, O Lord, it extends to the heavens and your faithfulness to the clouds and your righteousness is like the mighty mountains and your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. You see, David gloried in God's mercies and not humanity's failure. He focused on God's eternal steadfast love and not the hatred around him. He rested in God's faithfulness and not in the deceit of people. He meditated on God's righteousness and not on the evil plans of others. He trusted God's judgment and he didn't become discouraged by the apparent victory of rude men and women. He walked in God's salvation and not in his own strength. David made choices about what the eyes of his heart focused on. David's song of praise continued. He didn't just declare the character and nature of God, but he then went on to declare the impact or the effect of God's presence and character and nature. David shared his testimony. He said these words, How precious is your steadfast love, O God! All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life and in your light we see light. So because God is merciful, 
His people can find refuge in him. Because God is faithful, we can feast on the goodness of God and find rest for our souls. Because God is right and just, we can come to him and be renewed by the water of life. Because God is light and life, we can find light and life in the midst of darkness. So what elements of God's character and nature do you know? What have you experienced of God in your life? Do you know the peace of God that when things are crazy in your life or around your life that you've got that peace that anchors your soul? Maybe you know the comfort of God. Maybe you've experienced the healing of God. Maybe you've had words of revelation that have given clarity to things that are happening around you and you've just gone, yes, I can move forward now. Thank you, God. What is your experience of God's presence in your life? Because that is your testimony. And it is your testimony that will overcome the darkness and the wickedness of sin around you. So David chose to declare and to focus on the character and nature of God and the impact of that in his life and the lives of godly people around him. So moving forward, our best defense against wickedness and rebellion always has been and always will be prayer. The psalmist launches into a powerful prayer. Continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. Do not let the foot of the arrogant tread on me or the hand of the wicked drive me away. You see, David, in closing, prayed that God's mercy and righteousness would continue to captivate his heart because he didn't want to get caught up in the evil. He didn't want to get caught up in it and start behaving that way and he didn't want to get caught up in it and be distracted and overwhelmed and overcome and depressed by it. He asked God to guard his heart and mind, to keep him safe from the cares of the world around him. He wanted to abide in humble submission to the Lord rather than rising up in pride like the wicked people and start disregarding him. Church, our best defense against the wickedness around us is to pray, is to ask God to guard our hearts and our minds from the wickedness around us so that we won't be discouraged by it and we won't get caught up in it and start behaving that way. Our best defense against the wickedness around us is to then declare the character and nature of God and the impact of that in our life. Share our testimony with the people around us. That is where the light and life of God manifests and shines through the church. Keep testifying to the character and nature of God and let people hear what your life with God is like. Church, do not be discouraged by those who no longer fear the Lord. Do not be afraid of those who plot malicious attacks. Do not be concerned by those who speak lies and behave in wicked ways. These behaviours do not change who God is, and they do not need to change who we are. I want to read to you a statement that Jesus declared to his closest friends. That's us. This is a snapshot of verses from John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, because he abides with you, and he will be with you. I have said this to you so that you may have peace, because in the world you face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. Hallelujah. <laughs> in Christ, we can overcome the cares and the wickedness and the evil in the world. He has overcome it. The stone's been rolled away. And we live in the victory of his resurrection. 
We have everything we need to combat the wickedness around us. We have faith in God's steadfast love, his faithful, righteous judgments that will save us. And we can testify to life in a relationship with God and what that means for us. And declaring this in the world is what will overcome the world. So do not be discouraged, but be inspired by God at his best. And don't forget to come to the prayer night for the, for the church, declaring this over Ukraine and the cares of this world. This is an opportunity for us as a church community to live out this Psalm 36 in our life. So be inspired by God's victory and not by humanity's sin. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for this word. Thank you that in this, David has named the issues of of sin and rebellion around us, but also given us a clear passage to overcoming, a clear pathway to rising above and to declare your love and your faithfulness to all generations. And so today we commit ourselves to this. We commit ourselves to to choosing not to look at the dirt, but to lift up our eyes and to focus on you. Come, Holy Spirit, and seal this word and this work in our life and remind us of how good and faithful God is. Hallelujah. Amen. Church, if you would like to receive prayer this morning for something that is happening in your life, please come forward as uh, we sing this final song and I'll pray with you. Thanks, Karen. And also thank you to Jan as well. Um, Ukraine and Russia has been a issue that's been on my heart a lot. And I just wanted to share with you just for a moment that we have some dear, wonderful friends that are in our Bible study group. Alex and Jenny and Alex was born in the new Ukraine and Jenny was born in Russia and then Alex moved and they got married and um, the things that they share with us is just things that we just cannot believe. Alex's brother is um, working in an engineering company and he has two small children and his wife is also pregnant and he received the letter from Putin to send him out to the front. So it's, it's just things like that that I just can't even imagine. So, um, you know, as Karen said, our best defence and our only defence from here is that we need to pray and put it over to our Lord. So let's stand together and sing our final song together. How great is our God. Joy, here 
So let us go as the people of God, with our eyes firmly fixed on the greatness of God, declaring to all generations his steadfast love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace to love and to serve. Amen.